things that were on my heart for today's message. We're going to be found in, in one verse I'll read to you. And the verse is actually in John 14. We're not going to be there, but let me just read the verse. In verse 19, Jesus said, Yet a little while, and the world seeth me no more, but you see me. Because I live, you shall live also. And what was on my heart as I was thinking about this time of the season, this day that we set aside to celebrate the resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ, was the fact that he had gone to the cross. He, he truly took our sins upon himself. And he carried those sins. He, he owned those sins. And he was punished for those sins. To the point not only of the physical affliction that was upon him through the cross, but that separation from the Father that that he had never experienced. A separation that you and I would have to experience for all eternity because our sin separates us from God, and yet he experienced the fullness of it at the cross, and he cried out, My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? And then it says, He gave up the ghost, the spirit, and he died upon declaring that it was finished, that he paid it in full. But the story never ended there. Because as you and I know, on the third day he rose again. And he conquered death. And he came out of the grave. And he offers everlasting life for all who will believe. And it's that everlasting life that he wants us to walk in, to experience, even on this earth, to, to live it out, to, to be alive for him. Because I live, you're going to live also. And, and the scripture gives us a clue of that kind of life. It's called an abundant life, life more abundantly. And so often the world and, and even our old nature tries to hinder us from walking in that new life. Oh, through the pressures all around us, the, the situations of family and life, the things that, that you know, we, we face every day, the little conflicts within families and marriages and, and all the things that the enemy tries to do with the temptation and, and all those things. And it, it's, it's very destructive, but it hinders us from walking in that new life. What I want to do is kind of walk through the time that Jesus was on the cross, the resurrection of the dead, and then do a comparison uh, of the new life of one that he truly raised from the dead while he was on earth. So why don't we begin and jump in Mark chapter 15. Mark 15. Gospel of Mark, all the way toward the end of that gospel. We're actually going to begin in verse 20. In Mark 15, verse 20, it says, And when they had mocked him, they mocked Jesus. They pronounced him guilty. They declared he was a, a blasphemer and he needs to be destroyed and killed. And Pilate had sentenced him to be crucified. And when they mocked him, they took off the purple from him, the purple robe or garments, and they put his own clothes on him and they led him out 
to crucify him. And they compelled one Simon, a Cyrenian, who passed by coming out of the country, the father of Alexander and Rufus, to bear his cross. And they bring him unto the place Golgotha, which is to be interpreted the place of a skull. And they gave him to drink wine mingled with myrrh, kind of a sedative that they were offering him, and he received it not. And when they had crucified him, they parted his garments, casting lots upon them, whatever man should take. And it was the third hour, and they crucified him, about 9 a.m., and the superscription of his accusation was written over the king of the Jew, Jews. And with him they crucified two thieves, the one on his right hand, the other on his left. And the scripture was fulfilled, which saith, and he was numbered with the transgressors. As you read that portion in Isaiah basically 53, Isaiah 53, verses 3 to 12, you will see there toward the end of those passages, he says that he was numbered, he was, he was marked with the transgressions of us, but he was also crucified with the transgressors. He was there on the cross with two thieves that were next to him. Verse 29, and they that passed by railed on him, wagging their heads and saying, Ah, thou that destroyeth the temple and buildeth it in three days, save thyself and come down from that cross. And I can tell you he was not going to come down from that cross. He stayed on that cross to fulfill the Father's will and to die for you and I. He stayed on that cross. I'm so glad that he didn't come off it and say it's not worth it. He didn't look into the future and see one named Kirk Dudek and said, man, it's not worth it. I'm out of here. No, he stayed because of his incredible love for you and I and his obedience to his father. But they yelled, Save thyself, come down from the cross, save thyself. Likewise also, the chief priests mocking said unto themselves with the scribes, He saved others, himself he cannot save. No, it's not that he can't save himself, but he will not save himself because he was there to save you. It was there to save me. It wasn't there to save himself. And he took the fullness of the cross so that you and I could be forgiven. His life didn't matter to himself. His obedience to the Father, his, his desire that, that the world would not be lost and perish, but those that are in the world could find everlasting life and be saved. And so he stayed on the cross. It's not that he couldn't. He chose not to. Let Christ, the King of Israel, descend now from the cross that we may also see and believe. And they that were crucified with him reviled him. Yeah, like he didn't do enough miracles when he was on the earth for them to believe. I mean, what did they need? Just one more miracle, just do one more, and, and then we'll believe. He already raised the people from the dead. He already healed the lame and gave sight to the blind and hearing to the deaf. He already did the miracles and cast out the demonic. And yet they said, if you do this, if you, if you do this and come down, then we'll believe. And I can tell you, they wouldn't have believed. And I encourage people, you don't need one more miracle to believe in Jesus. 
You don't need one more thing. Oh, well, if God does this in my life, then I'll, I'll follow him. He's already done everything. And the greatest thing he done for you and I is when he stretched out his arms and they were nailed to a cross. And he owned and took your sin upon him and paid the price. He's already done everything that I needed to see a Savior do. I don't need one more thing in my life to be sold out for Christ. Lord, if you just change this situation, it, it, Lord, you know, if, if you put me into a, a different neighborhood, kind of a, maybe an influential one, if you, if you just change my job, if you just bring in the right person for me to share my life with, if you had changed the one that I'm married to, if you just would, if you would change that one, I'm all in. And it's like the Lord doesn't need to do one more thing for me to be all in for Christ because he's already done it all. If you descend now and we see, we'll believe. No, you won't. He's already done it all. And when the sixth hour was come, there was darkness over the whole land until the ninth hour. And at the ninth hour, Jesus cried with a loud voice saying, Eloi, Eloi, lama sab um, sabachthani, which is being interpreted, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? And at that moment, the separation from God the Father and God the Son. In, in all I can describe is in a, a fullness, an experience of my eternal separation from God. And I don't know how all that works, but it was, it was horrendous upon him. For the Son of God, the, the Son of Man, to cry out with those words. And he chose to stay on the cross even though he knew that moment light up ahead. A moment that he never experienced to be separated from the Father. And, and I can't understand it. And yet he knew it was up ahead and he stayed on the cross and experienced it so that you and I would never have to experience that separation, but that we could be with him for all eternity. And I think, does he really need to do one more thing for me to follow with my whole heart, to believe, to trust him? He doesn't have to do one more thing. He's already done it all. And some of them that stood by when they heard it said, Behold, he calleth Elijah. And one ran, filled a sponge with vinegar or sour wine, and put it on a reed and gave him to drink, saying, Let alone, let us see whether Elijah will come to take him down. As they were crying out about, Let's see. Leave him be. Let's see if Elijah helps him. And Jesus cried with a loud voice, and he gave up the ghost. He gave up the spirit. He, he died in that moment for you and I. And the veil of the temple was rent in twain from the top to the bottom, knowing it was not of man but of God. God rent that and gave access for man to come into the Holy of Holies where the mercy seat of God is on top of the Ark of the Covenant to come in and find mercy and grace from their Creator, their Savior, and their Lord. And when the centurion which stood over against him saw that he so cried out and gave up the ghost, and he said, truly, this man was the Son of God. There's no greater statement than that. 
when a man declares this truly, Jesus is the Son of God. He is. And there were also women looking afar off, among whom was Mary Magdalene, and Mary the mother of James, and the less, and Joseph and Salome, who also, when he was in Galilee, followed him and ministered unto him, and many other women which came up with him unto Jerusalem. And now when Eve was come, because it was the preparation that is the day before the Sabbath, Joseph of Arimathea, an honorable counselor, which also waited for the kingdom of God. I, I love that phrase. What a description. Joseph, he, he waited for the kingdom of God. With expectation, he looked forward to the coming of Messiah. And there he is. And he witnessed what he was looking forward to. He, he was longing, he was looking forward to that, waiting with, with expectation. And he's like, I know Messiah is going to come. I know the Savior is going to come. And there he is, face to face with him. And he saw him, how he came and how he died for him. And his heart was moved. And I thought, Lord, help me to have that same expectation for your second coming. Help me to have that. Say, Lord, you're coming. I'm expecting it. I'm looking for it. I'm waiting for it. I'm living for it. And because you're alive, I can now live for you with hope and expectation. He's coming soon. I don't know about you, but that's been stirring up in my heart in these last months and maybe a year or so. The Lord's coming back, and the signs are everywhere. And with expectation, I look forward to that return. And here, Joseph, what a statement that the Holy Spirit has given him in Scripture. Waited for the kingdom of God, came and went in boldly unto Pilate, and craved the body of Jesus. I mean, the, the word is used with great desire. He had boldness. He came before Pilate, who just sentence this man to be crucified not sure not knowing what this man will do to him he might say and you're going to be crucified next week but here he had boldness and he came and he craved he desired i want to take the body of my savior and i want to do something honorable with it i, I, I want to take his body and allow it to to have an honorable meaning behind it and and a proper burial was his heart. And notice in verse 44, and Pilate marveled if he were already dead. I, I mean, that wasn't the common thing, that he would die within six hours, that one who would be crucified could hang there for days. And so he marveled. Was he already dead? And calling on to him the centurion, he asked, him whether he had been dead a while. Has he, has he already died? And when he knew it, of the centurion, he gave the body to Joseph. And I wondered, you know, how come he died in such short of time? The crucifixion could last days. And yet, it's because of what Jesus had declared you see, it wasn't the crucifixion that killed him. In fact, he gave his life. And when the payment was finished, he gave up the ghost. It, it, it wasn't necessarily the crucifixion. It was the payment for sin that killed him. And he knew upon that separation from the Father when he cried, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? He knew that the payment was being paid at that moment in the fullness of it. And then he declared the same and said, it is finished, paid in full, totalistai. It's completely paid 
and he gave up the ghost. In fact, earlier in John, in John 10, I mean, in John 10, you read there in verses 17 through 18, therefore does my father love me because I laid down my life that I may take it up again. No man taketh it from me, but I lay it down myself, is what he declared. Pilate didn't take his life. Jesus laid it down so that you and I could rise up. That you and I could come out of the grave and live for him and live forever. He did it. And he brought fine linen and took him down and wrapped him in linen and laid him in a sepulcher which was hewed out of rock and rolled a stone unto the door of the sepulcher. And Mary Magdalene and the mother and mother uh, Mary, the mother of Joseph, behold where he was laid. And then it continues on. And when the Sabbath was passed, Mary Magdalene and Mary, the mother of James and Salome, had bought uh, sweet spices that they might come and anoint him. And very early in the morning, the first day of the week, they came unto the sepulcher at the rising of the sun. And they said among themselves, who shall roll us away the stone from the door of the sepulcher? And when he had looked, or they looked, they saw that the stone was rolled away, for it was very great. And entering into the sepulcher, they saw a young man sitting on the right side, clothed in the long white garment, and they were affrightened. And he said unto them, Be not afraid. You seek Jesus of Nazareth, which was crucified. He is risen. He is not here. Behold the place where they laid him. He is risen. But go your way, tell the disciples and Peter, the love of our Savior to encourage Peter after Peter denied him, after Peter failed him, he said, now be sure to tell Peter because I want him to know that I'm alive and he'll know that I still love him. I still love him. He doesn't know what to do. He, he feels like he blew it. This was, this was the worst thing. This was, this was worse than ever before of his faults and his sins. But I want him to know that I conquered it. And I paid for it. And I'm going to come to him. And I'm going to empower him. And I'm going to use him once again mightily for my kingdom. Go tell Peter. And he goeth before you into Galilee that there you shall see him as he said to you. Turn to John chapter 20. Let's pick it up in verse 18. And Mary Magdalene came and told the disciples that she had seen the Lord and that he had spoken these things unto her. And the same day at evening, being the first day of the week, when the doors were shut, where the disciples were assembled, for fear of the Jews. Jesus didn't allow their fears, their struggles to stop him bringing his very presence into their life. I'm so glad that even in our hard days and hard times, he busts through those things and he reveals himself to us and declares his love for us and it blows me away. I'm like, how could you, Lord? 
I feel like Peter, depart from me, Lord. I'm a sinful man. And he says, fear not. Meaning, you never have to fear that. I will never, ever leave you. Never. And so he came in. And Jesus stood in the midst and said unto them, Peace be unto you. And when he had so said, he showed him unto them his hands and his side. Then were the disciples glad when they saw the Lord. Then said Jesus to them again, Peace be unto you. As my Father has sent me, even so send I you. It's time to live for me, guys time to come alive and when he had thus said this he breathed on them and said unto them receive ye the holy ghost it's time to come alive to be born again to be sealed with the holy spirit of promise now go live for me i came out of my tomb and i have brought you out of yours now go live and when I read that and, and saw that, I couldn't help but think of what happened earlier in the Gospel of John, the story of Lazarus. Turn to John chapter 11. John chapter 11. Let's, uh, let's grab a few verses in the beginning of that chapter. Verse 1 says, and now a certain man was sick named Lazarus of Bethany, the town of Mary, and her sister Martha. It was that Mary which anointed the Lord with ointment and wiped his feet with her hair, whose brother Lazarus was sick. Therefore his sister sent unto him, saying, Lord, behold, he whom thou lovest is sick. And there's a lot of times that we don't understand that statement. If he loved me, why am I sick? If he loves me, why am I struggling? If he loves me, why do I have to go through this? And yet, we should never doubt that he does love us. He truly does. And he's going to be glorified through it. And you and I are going to become more like him in that process. And so she sends the word to him in verse 4, and Jesus heard that. He said, this sickness is not unto death, but for the glory of God, that the Son of God may be glorified thereby. This is for the glory of God. This this sickness is not unto death. This, it's not unto permanent death. And, and it's the same with us, that our sickness of sin is not unto permanent death, or in our case, spiritual death. Because he's going to call us out by name, and we're going to live. And so he says, this isn't unto death, but it's for God's glory. That, that this life, this season of life that he's living is for the glory of Jesus Christ. And, and I don't know what Lazarus might have been thinking when he was laying there. I, I know that the sisters were distraught, and, and they were perplexed. And even as we're going to see, they were like, but if you would have been here, things would have been different. And who knows what Lazarus was thinking in this state that this sickness was, was something that would bring him to physical death. Whatever this ailment was, as it might have lingered and, and progressed and gotten worse, and he's thinking, I don't understand. I, I can't get it. I mean, Jesus, I, we're friends. He loves us. He, he comes over all the time and we, we eat together. And yet, when I feel I need him the most, I don't see him. When, when my hurt is the greatest, I don't know where he is. 
And yet, if he could have heard the words, what you're going through is for the glory of the Son of God. And it's not permanent. It, it's not forever. And so it moves on. And it says, Now Jesus loved Martha and her sister and Lazarus. And I got a rust in that. That no matter what I go through, the statement has already been declared, He loves me. And that's where I put my trust and hope. Not the circumstance of my life. Nor whether it changes or not that I know he loves me. And so the scripture declares this, that he loves them. We can jump ahead to verse 19. And many of the Jews came to Martha and Mary to comfort them concerning their brother. Then Martha, as soon as she had heard that Jesus was coming, went and met him, but Mary sat still in the house. Then said Martha unto Jesus, Lord, if thou hast been here, my brother had not died. Lord, if you were here, if you just were here, Lord, my brother wouldn't have died. I don't understand why you weren't here. And here he, she says, but I know that even now, whithersoever thou will ask of God, God will give it to thee. And Jesus said unto her, thy brother shall rise again. And Martha said unto him, I know that he will rise in the resurrection at the last day. And Jesus said unto her, I am the resurrection and the life. He that believeth in me, though he were dead, yet shall he live. And whosoever liveth and believeth in me shall never die. Believest thou this? You see, take your eyes off the physical and put them on the eternal because that's where there's hope. That's where there's comfort. The physical world has been plagued by sin. But we're not destined to the physical world. They're tied to it to its end. That we have a future and a hope in Jesus Christ. And it extends past the physical. And that's where I always need to keep my eyes. Past the physical circumstances of life. The physical situations of society, our government, the culture, and look beyond that to the eternal, to the everlasting. And she said unto him, Yea, Lord, I believe. And so he asked, Do you believe this? Yes, I do believe. Thou art the Christ, the Son of God, which should come into the world. And when she had so said, she went her way and called Mary, her sister, secretly, saying, The Master is come and calleth for thee. And as soon as that they had heard, they rose quickly, or she rose quickly and came unto him. Now Jesus was not yet come into the town, but he was in that place where Martha met him. And the Jews, then which were with her in the house, and comforted her when they saw Mary, that she rose up hastily and went out, followed her, saying, She is going unto the grave to weep there. And then when Mary was come, where Jesus was, and saw him. She fell down at his feet, saying unto him, Lord, if thou hast been here, my brother had not died. And she too was plagued with that thought. If you were here, this wouldn't have happened. What she was really saying is, you love us. How could you let this happen? She didn't understand. And Jesus therefore saw her weeping, and the Jews also weeping, which came with her. And he groaned at his spirit and was troubled and said, 
where have you laid him? And they said unto him, Lord, come and see. And Jesus wept. He was saddened on how sin had plagued the world and the grief and the hurt that it's brought. But he was going to remind them that he overcame the world. And then said the Jews, Behold how he loved him. And some of them said, Could not this man which opened the eyes of the blind have caused that even this man should not have died? Well, yes. But he's going to do one better. He's going to raise him from the dead. And I think, Lord... Even in my life, with all the things that have happened, you truly did one better thing than keeping me from all those things. You raised me from the dead. You, you did the greatest thing, the, the, truly the thing that I needed. You raised me from the dead. Now I have an eternal home with you forever. And Jesus, therefore, again groaned in himself, cometh to the grave. It was a cave, and a stone laid upon it. And Jesus said, Take away the stone. And Martha, the sister, said unto him, Lord, by this time I love the King James. He stinketh, for he has been dead four days. He, he stinketh, Lord. Lord, this, this is not a good environment, what's going on in there. You see, the Jews believed that the spirit hung around the body for three days because on the fourth day, corruption and decay would set in and the spirit would have left. And that's why they marked, this is the fourth day. This is even beyond the hope of him coming back to life. That this, this is, he stinketh. He's decaying by now. There is... There is great decay that's going on inside that tomb. And Jesus said unto her, Said I not unto thee, that if thou wouldest believe, thou shouldest see the glory of God. You see, there is no situation that is beyond the reach and the hope and the help of Jesus Christ. There is none. There's nothing you can say, but this has gone too far. This situation has brought an end. This is over. It's dead. And if you think there's a situation that is dead in your life, I know one who specializes in raising things that are dead. And his name is Jesus. And he said, take away the stone. And they took away the stone, in verse 41, from the place where the dead was laid. And Jesus lifted up his eyes and said, Father, I thank thee that thou hast heard me. I know that thou hearest me always. But because of the people which stand by, I said, um, I said it, that they may believe that thou hast sent me. And when he had thus spoken, he cried with a loud voice, Lazarus. Come forth. And I love the comments that people have made over the years that if he didn't use the name, every grave in the world would open up <laughs> and the dead would be walking around everywhere. And he's like, Lazarus, this one, this Lazarus here, come forth. And when he that was dead came forth bound, hand and foot with the grave clothes. And his face was bound about with a napkin. And Jesus said unto them, Loose him and let him go. Jesus called him out. And now he stands there alive. He heard the master's voice. You've been in the grave long enough. You've been in that place long enough it is something that has caused decay and desirous of death and I'm telling you walk out of it walk out of that tomb 
Don't stay in there any longer. Come forth. And he came forth, and, and I could imagine a conversation. I'm, 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 I came out, Lord, but I still have all the reminders of death clothed upon me in grave clothes. And he said, I know, but I've raised others around you to help loose you and free you of those. That's why there's this church of fellowship, brothers and sisters. And he said to them that we're around him, that we're lamenting with him, go free him. Help him out of those grave clothes. Help him out of them. And when you come alive and you get plugged into a fellowship, God will raise up brothers and sisters to help you out of those old reminders, those old clothes, so that you can truly be free. And so they loosed him. And they freed him. And there he was able to live for the Lord, to, to serve the Lord, to have sweet fellowship with the Lord. In fact, you see that here in, in chapter 12, it says six days uh, went by before the Passover, six days before the Passover came, in verse 1, to Bethany, where Lazarus was, which had been dead, whom he raised from the dead. So Jesus came to this area, and here Lazarus, being alive, and there made him a supper, and Martha served, but Lazarus was one of them that sat at the table with him. Lazarus came into a public place, so that he could be a witness and a testimony of a changed life. That he could, he could be an example. I mean, that, what a great example. You know, everyone's talking about, yeah, well, you know, um, Bitcoin just went up. Oh, well, that's really great, you know. And, and you know, I stubbed my toe and, and I'm feeling better. Great. And Lazarus is just waiting his turn. You know, well, I had four wisdom teeth pulling out, but, but I'm over it. Lazarus just waiting. He goes, hmm, I was dead. And it's like, well, I can't top that one. Go ahead, dead man. Tell us what happened. And he's like, well, you see, I was dead, man. In fact, you know, my sister told me I was really stinketh. And, and I heard a name, of, uh, and it was mine. And I heard a voice, and it was my Savior. And he called me out of the grave. And now I'm alive. And I want to be in your presence so you can see what a changed life by Jesus Christ looks like. This is what it is. And he displayed a witness for Christ. Look at verse 9. Much of the Jews therefore knew that he was there. And they came not for Jesus' sake only, but they might see Lazarus also, whom he had raised from the dead. Lazarus, now a testimony, a witness. He's a changed life, and so are you. You're a changed life by the hand of your Savior who called your name, and you came out of that tomb and you walked out of that grave, and you are now who were dead or alive for Christ. And there's a witness to be seen. Man, don't, don't fear the world and go hide back in the tomb. He called you out of it. And now let them live through you. Be that light and witness. And they came to see it. And he... He didn't hide. Here I am, a changed man. But notice this. There's always going to be those that want to put you back in the grave. There's always going to be situations, circumstances, or even individuals that want to put you back in the grave. But the chief priests 
consulted that they might put Lazarus also to death. We can't have this living Jesus freak man walking around the world declaring the glory of God. We got to find a way to put him back in that grave. And the enemy is clever. He plots and he plans how can I get him back in the grave so he is no longer a witness? And he has done some incredible things, that enemy, and he's pulled out the right things, he's put in the right pieces, and he's discouraged in the right ways to put us back in the grave. And I say to you, by the power of the risen Savior, Jesus Christ, don't let him. Don't let him. Don't go back there. Man, I was already dead. I, I, I don't need to go back in the grave. It, it wasn't good. It, it, it stunk <laughs> in our vernacular. He called me out, and I'm going to live for him. And I'm not going to let people, circumstances, or situation, or things going on in my own mind to get me back in that grave because I'm now alive for Christ. And he's called us out to live for him. And because that by reason of him, many of the Jews went away and believed on Jesus. And because of you who have been raised from the dead spiritually and alive now, many can believe on Jesus Christ. Man, he, he has done so much for us. And, and now it's time to live for him. It, it's really time to rise up, to step out of that grave and say, man, I'm not going back. By the power of Jesus Christ, I'm not going back and I don't care who wants to put me back in the grave. I don't care what thoughts want to plague me. They're all surrendered to the power and the authority of Jesus because I'm going to be a light, a witness, and I'm walking forward in the Lord. And there's power in that. And there's a testimony in that. And there's salvation for others in that when they see the transformed life that he gave you. It's a powerful thing. And as a church, we get to remember and celebrate how that all came to be by going to communion, by understanding what he has done, by remembering his death and his resurrection. As we Take our cup, the smaller end you open first, a little easier than the foil package we had. And you can reveal the, the wafer, the bread. As we take of the bread, let us remember that Jesus gave his life and he paid for your sin your shame, your struggles in full, in complete fullness. Let us remember and partake together. Thank you, Lord. Thank you for what you have done. Thank you that you took our sin, you owned our sin, you died for our sin. And you said, it is paid in full. Thank you that if we confess our sin, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sin and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. All. Thank you for forgiving us. Turn the cup over. Peel the top away from the juice. And let us remember that when Jesus shed his blood, he washed our sin away. And you stand before him 100% clean. He 
brought you out of the grave, there's no need to go back. There's only need to go forward. Let us remember and partake. We do thank you, Lord, for what you have done. We thank you that you had died for us and we today can even celebrate that. But not just the death, but that you rose again and you forever live. And because you live, we can live also. We thank you. We praise you. Help us to declare you to all that are around us with expectation and hope and waiting for your return. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. I have a verse, if the worship team would come up. I do have a, a small passage in Colossians. In Colossians chapter 1. Let me read to you what Jesus has done. We'll begin in the middle of verse 9. It says that you might be filled with the knowledge of his will and all wisdom and spiritual understanding, that you might walk worthy of the Lord unto all pleasing, being fruitful in every good work and increasing in the knowledge of God, strengthened with all might according to his glorious power unto all patience and long-suffering with joyfulness, giving thanks unto the Father which has made us fit to be partakers of the inheritance of the saints in light, who has delivered us. Man, hold on to this, you know, saint of God. Who has delivered us from the power of darkness and translated us into the kingdom of his, his dear Son, in whom we have redemption through the blood, even the forgiveness of sin. And that sounds like he made us alive. So you go out and you live and let nothing, nothing try to put you back in the grave. Let's stand and worship the Lord.